When you think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there are other alternatives to explain why the body of Jesus could not be found. And we ask the question, just what happened to it? In Matthew, the 28th chapter, I'll give you another reason for why the body of Jesus was not found. And they'll tell you kind of what happened that disagrees with the resurrection. And while they were going, these were people getting ready to go and tell people about that Christ is not in the tomb. While they were going, behold, some of the guard came unto the city and told unto the chief priests all the things that were come to pass. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave much money unto the soldier, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. And if thou come to the governor, if that, if that comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him, or we will appease him, as some translations have, and rid you of care. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying was spread among the Jews and continueth unto this day. There's your alternative version. Not the resurrection. It's that the disciples came and stole the body and took it away and then began to proclaim the fact of the resurrection. Sometimes you may think of it, isn't that convenient? We read our Bibles and we, we come with a resurrection and so that's just not a, a real good reason. I wonder if I said it's the best one that has ever been offered. What would you say to that? You want to come up with a better one? Have at it. Because when we speak about something that happens in time, if you're going to deal with what's revealed, and these are things that this saying continued unto the day in which Matthew writes, that had, had a popular impact upon the people of that day, I want to know why the body of Jesus was not found. What happened to that body? And there must be an adequate, adequate, adequate cause for the fact. What's the fact? Nobody. And the chief priest came up with an idea. But there's got to be an adequate, adequate cause. There is no adequate cause known for the fact. If that's the case, then the fact just falls. If there are two or more causes that may be known, we're going to have to take a, a choice, make a choice. We've got to weigh each one of those causes. Were they sufficient to be able to make that fact known? There's no body of Jesus. Could they, stole, could they have stolen the body? Could there be a resurrection? We might make, have to make a choice. But the only other scenario is, there's only one, only one adequate cause or sufficient cause that may be known. What we see in the New Testament, what is revealed in the New Testament, is that that cause is sufficient. That's why there is no body. And number two, that's why the disciples who witnessed his death and proclaimed the resurrection, that's why they were believers. Because those two things happened. That indeed people believed in the resurrection. I believe in the resurrection even to this day. It has had an impact. That is a fact. And it starts with the people. Oh, in fact, there's five women that were witnesses. There were 12 apostles. There was a period of time where after his death and after his resurrection, they saw him. And they gave their testimony. It's a fact. And what is the cause behind it? They stole him. 
His disciples stole him. God says he resurrected him from the dead. And that's why his body's not there. These are admitted facts, nobody. And people all of a sudden became believers. Was it they stole the body or was it the resurrection? Well, I don't like that stolen and stealing the body type thing. Well, tell me a better one. Tell me a better one. Ferdinand Bear, who lived in 1792 to 1860, who became one for the 20th century, what the atheist and what critics would say that Jesus wasn't raised. When he lived among those German critics and he heard all of the answers, you know what he said? The question as to the nature and the reality of the resurrection lies outside the sphere of historical investigation. We can't even investigate it. New Testament criticism. Paul didn't write all the letters that he did. He, he mentions the ones he does. He is trying to look at Jesus and the resurrection. The idea of its reality. It lies outside the sphere of historical investigation. When you think about that, it's amazing. Because the most important event upon which church history depends is now beyond inquiry. That's what it's saying. That's the most important event for the church. It is the crowning miracle. You don't have to go find out why all the other miracles couldn't have happened. Explain all of them. Take on this one. Because if you disprove the resurrection, if that's something, there's your crowning miracle. Just take that one. If you disprove that, it, it's, it takes care of everything else. Because wonder if the others are true. This one, the resurrection, defeats them all. Because it is the crowning miracle. The church does not exist in history without that miracle taking place in time. It's history. And here is a critic. No miracles and such. So, so, we just can't investigate it. It's beyond historical investigation, so don't bother. That's just amazing to me. It's kind of like what people and evolutionists today, you know, this idea of God, we're not going to put God as a possibility because uh, that's beyond science. And so we rule him out. And so we're going to deal with science and rule out who brings all things into existence. That's not even a possibility. That's kind of the same thing with the resurrection. It's just beyond historical investigation. It is the crowning moment. It's like looking at the history of the United States and trying to establish why it exists and deny that there was ever a declaration of independence. Just deny it. It's beyond inquiry. You don't have the United States without the Declaration of Independence. This is the crowning moment in history for the church. Why can't we inquire? I think you'll know why he didn't want you to inquire. Because we're going to take the great minds of the 19th century, who are the 20th century philosophers and critics will depend upon, and we'll begin to see why Bauer may say what he did. The French theologian, Joseph Renan. His monumental work was the life of Jesus. And I want you to notice what he thinks of Jesus. Jesus will ever be the creator of a pure spirit of religion. The Sermon on the Mount will never be surpassed. Whatever revolution takes place will not prevent us attaching ourselves in religion to the grand and intellectual moral line at the head of which shines the name of Jesus. 
the faith, the enthusiasm, the constancy of the first Christian generation is not explicable, except by supposing that at the origin, the whole movement of man, and we'll add to that, pretty good praise has taken place. He continues, That's, let us place then the person of Jesus at the highest summit of human greatness. Now here's a man that exalting Jesus as a historical figure. Whatever revolution takes place, he's at, the, he's at the head of that. It's grand, it's wonderful. He sums up his, meaning Christ, perfect idealism is the highest rule of the unblemished and virtuous life. Not only his, but ours. The foundation of true religion is indeed his work but he's going to be a denier of the resurrection I ask you can you praise Jesus like that and if Jesus was not raised from the dead did he not deceive us I just take one passage of scripture because I'm seeing my Lord before he dies upon the cross He's making the statement pretty plain of what's going to happen in Jerusalem. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and be killed. But that's not the end of it. And after three days, rise again. That's what he's saying is going to happen. Prophet, and the resurrection did not occur. You're not much of a prophet. In fact, by God's standard, you're a false prophet. And this is where the book of God places us. You see why some men don't want to go into inquiring too much about resurrection as a historical fact? Because if they start dealing with it, there's implications of it. And one of the things is, is how come He's going to be the source of a virtuous life when he is a liar, when he is a deceiver. Secondly, the foundation. What foundation? Apostle Paul, inspired of God, tells us there's no foundation. There's no church. There's no confidence in our belief when there is no resurrection. Oh, it wasn't a, will I be raised from the dead? Is that going to take place? Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. But listen to what he says in verse 14, or what he writes. If Christ has not been raised, and that's what Renan, Renan is going to say, if he hasn't been raised, he says, then is our preaching vain. Your faith, is vain also vain yea and we are all found false witnesses of God because we witnessed of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up if so be that the dead are not raised brings in our resurrection based upon the first fruits Christ resurrection what foundation see you can take Jesus as a great teacher moral leader at the summit of human civilization the pinnacle of purity Sermon on the Mount cannot be surpassed we love his teaching but the resurrection can't have but I'll take that part of Christ and I will just say the foundation of true religion is indeed his work it flow, it falls it implodes if there is not the resurrection of Christ and I think he is the ultimate deceiver. Because we're living a life for him. Knowing we have a lively hope for the future. And if he wasn't raised, what a deceiver of mankind. But this same man, Renan, he did more than Bauer would do. 
He said, let's consider why the body was not found. Now you see the other side of him, he says. In what place did the worms consume the lifeless corpse, which on the Friday evening had been deposited in the sepulcher? So he starts investigating it. Remember, Byer says, it's not, you can't investigate this. You know why? Because he's going to, he knew this was happening too. So let's look. It is possible. It is possible that the body was taken away by some of the disciples and by carrying, and, and, and by them carried into Galilee. You know, it took a little bit of the Bible. You know, they stole, that's the thing that the, that the Jewish people thought about when the, when the soldiers came and told them what happened. They stole the body, but they didn't tell him where the body was taken. Renan says, it's possible. He didn't say he believed it. Let's just throw something out there, because we've got to have another explanation. And we may not like the explanation that, that the Bible gives, because, see, we're German critics at this time, and we don't have much confidence in that. Let me just think from a theologian view of, of, of possibility of things that they carry away. Now, let's think about that for a moment. It is the hot part of the year. <laughs> and these disciples do a very difficult thing. Oh, you might think it was difficult to get into that tomb and steal that body. But to carry it to Galilee 60 miles away in the heat, carrying the body, they got a casket, got a beer, taking that in, and, and taking it in, and that's where they buried it, Renan says. It's a possibility. And they buried it in Galilee. That's what happened to your body. It wasn't a resurrection. Is that an adequate cause? If you want to steal a body, you don't have to carry it 60 miles. Why would they do that? Is that where the worms consume the lifeless corpse of Jesus? It is possible. <laughs> it is also possible, as he thinks and theorizes, to suppose that the disappearance of the body was the work of the Jews. Why would they do that? Because they knew how closely the people hung upon Jesus and they were afraid there was going to be a great tumult over his funeral. They might have a funeral procession. And besides that, they might build a monument to honor him. That's Renan's talk thinking. What would taking the body away interfere with those two? They could still have a ruckus funeral procession. And they still can make a monument. But he says it's, it's also possible that the Jews did that. Why would the Jews want to encourage? The idea is a missing body, and the idea, well, maybe it could be the resurrection. <laughs> That's why they came up with what they had. It's a lie. And the Jews had no interest in that. Why is that an adequate call? Thirdly, lastly, he's throwing them out there. At least he's discussing it. Byer wouldn't touch it. I think I know why. Renan does. He said, who knows that the disappearance of the body was affected by the proprietor of the garden or by the gardener. You know, they just threw that body in that sepulcher because that was close by. Is something that could get rid of real quickly. And maybe they did not like the way the body was placed in this proprietor's garden. And maybe he or had the garden, let's remove that body. Let's remove that body. Because they didn't like the way things were handled in his property. 
Yeah, that's Joseph Arimathea's tomb, by the way, but it's my land. And he explains it that way. You know what? If those were the possibilities, at that time, people didn't want to be close to a dead body. If somebody had been asking for that body, you think the gardener might not give it to him? You know, that's a possibility. I don't want to, this body's deteriorating. You got him. Get him off my hands. And if the disappearance of the body was the work of the Jews, why do they go to the trouble in Acts 4 and 5 and threaten, threaten the apostles? If they keep on preaching Christ, why would they do that? Oh, they knew where the body was. They knew where the body's buried. They could have presented a body. It's by now a deteriorating. They could say there's the remains. And all the disciples see, Renan says, they went off and they hadn't heard that the resurrection message was, because they're over there in Galilee, 60 miles. They got to rest a little bit. That's, I'm adding that. But they didn't know back home in Jerusalem, people are advocating the resurrection. And when they come back, they're going to keep their mouth shut. Really? They could have told the truth about what happened, but no, they're going to keep their mouth shut. So that's why it, it, it takes place. And after all, what they say were not to be listened to, really? When you present the body of Jesus as evidence, and nobody will listen to that? Ladies and gentlemen, those are his adequate causes. And by our statement, is so instructed because he didn't want to go to these crazy things. They're not adequate causes. That's why he takes it out of inquiry of history. Because you don't have a better explanation than what you have in the Bible. Both alternatives. Resurrection or what they were saying about him. We have to make a decision between, between those two. Renan continues. He, said the, he starts now investigating the witnesses. See, that's pretty good evidence. And how are these critics going to deal with that? What they're going to have to deal with is that what, what is the explanation of why these eyewitnesses, all different people, different times, claim the same fact? Well, he said they had ardent expectations. That it was a, something that was so grand that, was, uh, that they just weren't wanting it so badly they would believe anything. And when you look at the facts that are brought in the Bible, in Matthew 16, 21, 22, Jesus speaks about his death and resurrection. Why does Peter rebuke him? That these things will never happen. That will not happen to you, O Lord. Why are the two disciples still despondent in Luke 24? From Emos, that they were traveling. They were sad when Jesus meets up with them. We thought he was going to be our king. They weren't expecting it. It was an ardent expectation that was taking place. In verse 41, why does he come when Jesus appears to his disciples? Why are they still not believing when they've heard the message that Jesus was raised? And Thomas, in John 20 and 25, I've got to see the handprints, hand into his side, before I believe. They were ardent expectation people. That they didn't, they weren't thinking logically, they weren't thinking correctly when the eyewitnesses tell them who they are, when Jesus appears before them. What were they anticipating? They thought they saw a spirit, not Jesus in the flesh. But see, that's what makes the resurrection so believable. God can do that. But why do these people who weren't expecting it, who rebuked Jesus for thinking it, who deserted him 
when he was captured? Why would they become believers? Why would Jesus' brothers in the flesh, who do not believe him in John 7 and Acts 1, they're waiting for the anticipation of the Holy Spirit in Acts 1. What caused, what's the adequate cause for such changes in people? Almost overnight, the resurrection happened. But no, that's not a possibility. It's just ardent expectation. Now, Renan has not given you possibilities. He's contradicted the facts. That's how you deal with the Bible. You'll just contradict it as being fact. And that's not dealing with maybe the possibilities we've misread the facts. They're contradicting them. And then, here's a great one. They had excited nerves. Well, you just hallucinated. Some of you have been, you've had surgery and you've been on morphine and your loved ones come into the room and you're peeling spiders off the walls. You see things. They say, hey, what's the matter with you? And they're looking here and there. They're looking beyond you. They're having hallucinations. But are they still having them? Are they still looking and seeing spiders on the walls? You might want to go back to the hospital. But usually you get over that. You should come back to your senses. In the first century, here were logical people before and logical people afterwards who when it came down to the eyewitness accounts that they give, they wanted it so badly. When Mary heard her name and she heard it, it would probably sounded like Jesus because it was. She thinks it's the gardener. And when she finds this Jesus, she bows down and holds to his feet. He said, don't you latch hold of me. I haven't gone to the Father yet. And what Renan says, that she was anticipating this, and what she ended up seeing is not Jesus, but a shadow, a shadow that disappears. That's contradicting the evidence. It's not giving the possibility that she would just hallucinate. He wanted it so badly to be true. And what is interesting to me that Josephus says, in the first century, the one person that could never give testimony in court was a woman. She was never allowed to give testimony in a court of law in that Roman world. And who does God allow to be the declarers of the evidence. Five women. But see, their minds are full of levity and they're too bold to trust them. Now I'm not saying that about you. I'm so frivolous women thinking. And boy, don't you get on their bad side because they are bold. And they may say anything. You can't trust them in a court of law. That's the Roman world. And yet, who came to the tomb? Whom did the angel speak to? And they go and tell the evidence. And they're separate occasions of Jesus of, of, of appealing them. God is laying down the evidence, but the best man can do is they anticipate it so badly they want it to be true, and they were just hallucinating. Paul, you know why his eyes, why he's blinded? Because at Mount Hermon there was a thunderstorm, and it blinded him. It blinded him. And see, that becomes a problem because, see, he was one that not anticipating the resurrection. 
But he is the one, you can say, well, he, he wanted it so badly, but you've got to deal with blindness in the story. And so how do men deal with that? It was just a thunderstorm, not really Jesus. He was hallucinating. Is that an adequate cause? Is that something that may be true? Question. Why aren't there any witnesses of the resurrection? Why is that? No. When the angel rolls away the stone in the scriptures and sits upon that stone and the women are coming, he's risen. It's already happened. The resurrection's occurred. When the soldiers kind of are startled, when the angel comes and they're like dead men, they're just, they're just had to be, they're, they're positioned, with, they're, they're paralyzed. The resurrection has already occurred. They're just giving evidence of the evidence. There's no body. And the Bible does not go into the details of the resurrection. But man does. Man does. You want to find another explanation of the resurrection or the plausible reason that the Jews settled on? Had to give money for that to work. Let's just look at what people today call, these are the lost gospels of Christ. And one of them is the Gospel of Peter. Matthew, Bart, Luke, and John. Peter? It's the Gospel of Peter. It's dated in the second, third century. It's what brought about the Council of Nicene and, and the idea of trying to determine what is the canon of the New Testament. I knew these were around, but it didn't hit the standard that indeed this was an inspired book. This is an account of the resurrection. This is what men do when you leave it to them to give the account. In the night in which the Lord's day was drawing on, as the soldiers kept guard two by two and watch, there was a great voice in the heaven, and they saw the heavens open. And the two men descend with a great light and approach the tomb. And the stone that was put at the door rolled of itself, and made way in part, and the tomb was open, and both the young men entered in. When therefore these soldiers, those soldiers saw it, it was a, uh, it, they awakened the centurion and the elders, for they too were close by keeping guard. And as they declared what things they had seen again, they saw three men coming forth from the tomb. Two of them supporting one, two supporting one and a cross following them, and the heads of the two reached up to the heaven, but the one that was leading them, may the one they're carrying, rose above them. One that led them over past the heavens, and they heard a voice from the heavens saying, as a question, we interpret this, you have preached to them that sleep, and a response was heard from the cross. A talking, a talking horse? No, we got a talking cross. A response was heard from the cross? Yes. When you lived in these times and people gave their account of what happened, if you wanted to have an account, what was the resurrection like? This is the best men can do. It just appreciates the inspiration of the scriptures. They didn't give the account of that. It said, he's not here, he's risen. And when Paul wants to speak about the rest, he appeared to me also. He gives the account of his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his appearance. And there were eyewitnesses and he's one of them, five women. Twelve apostles. And he was the last of those apostles. This is what men do when they're not directed by the Holy Spirit. This is how they imagination goes. This is a product of men. The Bible doesn't do that. What the Bible did is that tell you, give you the evidence from eyewitness testimony that indeed, this indeed occurred. Occurred. There is an adequate cause known for the bodies not there. In fact, there's two possibilities that the Bible gives. Notice that 
Renan did not pick one of his three. He did not say this is better than the other one. He knew better. They're crazy. They're not explanations that are adequate. They're sufficient to give all the facts of why there's a church today. Why believers who weren't believers became believers. And it's not based upon hallucinations or they had an ardent desire for it to be true. They didn't expect it at all. But the best one I find is what the Jews paid their money for. If it's not the resurrection. But the resurrection is sufficient to answer the fact why there's no body. And to answer the fact why there's a church full of believers that happened at the time when Jesus was put to death. And why the body was never presented to me points me to the resurrection. Even among the critics and the skeptics, Bayer kind of took the fifth because he knew what was out there. Renan took the bait and ran. And you see what, there's not, there's not even better what Jesus book offers. But see, with Bauer and Renan, the evidence is too compelling to ignore. They have to deal with it. But see, like many, it's more demanding than one can accept. That's the problem. And we as believers in Christ have good evidence for the miraculous event of history. The crowning miracle the foundation for the church. He's not here, but he's risen. And we live our life for a risen Savior. And I hope you'll continue to do so. Man doesn't have much to offer that's different, that is adequate for you to put your faith in. And I hope you'll understand that, young people, and us older ones as well. We offer the invitation of a risen Savior. He died and was raised for our justification. Without his death, we cannot have our sins washed away by his blood. Without his resurrection, we'd have no name or authority to deliver us from sin. We would just have an exalted, praised rabbi whose worms ate the corpse, maybe in Galilee. But we know he was raised from the dead, he's upon his throne upon high, and he offers the invitation Come to me, I'll give you rest. You take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, you shall find rest for your souls. What a wonderful invitation the Lord offers. The risen Savior says, come to him, he'll save you. And I hope you'll do that now as we stand and as we sing.